Hey, welcome to another episode of the Shots from the Winchester podcast. This is only our second podcast being shot right here in the Winchester Bar, home of uh, Greencastle Consulting. We have an awesome guest in today. Uh, you've got, this guy's been all over national news. Tom Garvey, author of The Secret Apartment. Guy lived underground in Veterans Stadium, interacted with Flyers, Sixers, Phillies. Guys, for Philly fans, this is awesome. For anybody who loves a surreal story, this is a story you're going to want to stick around for. Stay tuned. This individuality stuff is a bunch of crap. There's a reason why. A master of innovation. The key to this growing is you. Any rational person would give up. I can't disagree with that. Make sure that we're not prisoners of our own experiences. You need a team of great people. We will not tolerate a loser. What they need is a common vision. Helping organizations win one veteran at a time. This is the Greencastle Podcast. All right. Hey, we are super excited. Another episode of the Shots from the Winchester Podcast. Our first one sitting here actually doing Shots from the Winchester, our bar here at Greencastle. We're excited to have with us today Tom Garvey, author of The Secret Apartment, uh, a surreal memoir. And we're going to talk about just how surreal it is. And, and I, think the, I think the name surreal really captures, I mean, I think that's almost an understatement about how in, insane that story is. Before we get started, it is the Shots from the Winchester podcast. Tom's selection, before we begin, it is, it is, uh, it, well, it's five o'clock somewhere, so. Yeah, this can go anywhere now. Th this can go anywhere. All right, my friend. We'll go easy, because it is before noon, so. Good enough? Yeah. Cheers, Bo. De Oppresso Libre. I think, uh, hey, maybe you can edit out and make me look like more manly when I take that shot. Um, so, Tom, like, uh, just tell us just uh, uh, the, the general overview of how the book came to be. So, and I want to talk a lot about the book and just, again, surreal is it does not accurately capture. You could have written in there like that aliens one day came down to visit you and I would have been like, oh, that makes sense because the rest of the book is that crazy and some of the stories and some of the experiences that you, that you had being able to live in this secret apartment in, uh, in Veterans Stadium. So kind of tell us just a, a backstory about, uh, about how the book came to be and then we'll kind of walk through the backstory about how you actually got there. Okay. I, I like the way the book came about because it came about from the purest motives and I'll confess I'm absolutely gobsmacked at how it took off but maybe there's some connection there. Uh, I've told these stories a hundred times, thousand times in bars and at parties and everything, but uh, I'd never written it down. And when the pandemic started a year ago, just a year ago, I put something on Facebook to my friends and said, watch this space. By the end of March, I'm gonna start putting out some stories about that stadium. And I pushed it to the last minute. I think the first one went out about 10 o'clock on March 31st. And about four or five days later, I did another, within a week, another, and so forth. And I got an incredible response. I mean, a, a mind-boggling response. And when I did clicks to see who was looking at it, there were like 80, 100 people. And so I just kept going. And then sometime in the summer, um, you know, someone said, you have over 30,000 words, you're getting into book length. So I started putting it together with the idea that it would be a book. Uh, I only wanted to have some fun with friends. We didn't know what was going to happen. My grandfather, my namesake, Thomas J. Garvey, died when he was very young in Chester, Pennsylvania in 1919 in the pandemic. He left my grandmother with two small children. One was less than three. That was my father, Jim, and his younger brother, Tommy, who I'm also named after. Yeah. So here's a woman in 1919 uh, with everything that was going on to that economy also with the pandemic. I, I don't really have any insight to that, but I imagine it was as weird as it was for us. Yep. And two small children. And I just wanted to, you know, I think sometime around St. Patrick's Day a year ago, I went out to the store by myself. Uh, my wife didn't go out for almost, you know, six months. And when I drove down the street, I didn't pass one car like two and a half miles down, usually, you know, you're in traffic, yeah. nothing. And I knew we were really up against something, so I wanted to just make some fun for friends and throw a little bit of diversion or relief or, or whatever. And the response was incredible, so I put the book out, 
So wait, let me stop you there. Yeah. So when you say the response, were people like, oh, no way. Oh, Tom, you're oh, shitting no, me. There's these, no way. No, none of these people. These people yeah. all knew it. That I came mean, later. Oh, yeah, these people. <laughs> well, it, it never came. It, it, it kind of never came. That's the amazing thing. The original articles about it would say man claims, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But by the time the New, New York Times article came out, and that was a half a page from the fold all the way yeah. to the bottom, all six columns, the top to bottom, side to side. And in that one, they came up with, uh, I gave them, to vet it, I gave them Billy Bradley's information yep. down in Texas. Legend here in Philly. Yeah, Jerry Sizemore, and in Texas. I mean, Billy is big. Yeah, yeah. Jerry and, Sizemore. All names yeah, who but, not only are big in Philly, but guys who knew and oh, could corroborate your oh, story. Yeah. Oh, Sizemore slept there one night. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was coming up. Oh, that, I'll get into that later. Yeah. But, but he was coming out to Paoli to see Dr. Stefano in the offseason. Okay. And he ended up spending the night there. And there's a whole there's a whole story in the book about that. Um, where was I? Uh, How so, the book so, came to be. You're, yeah, you so, start so, putting some posts so, out. Yeah, so I put these posts out, and I got a really good response. And then when the book came out around the 3rd of December, uh, someone called me up and said, Angelo Cataldi got wind of this because he's, he's asking questions. And I don't know how he heard about it originally, but he vetted me before he talked to me. And he got a hold of the book. And they said, you better get a book to Angelo because this could be good. And they said, he'll never buy the book. And I'm not disparaging Angelo here. Angelo makes a big thing of this on his show, as I've heard since sure. then. He said, he's really cheap. He says, I'm so cheap. He said, and he was talking on the radio. He said, you know, I'd never spend money on the book. He said, I spent my own money on this book. And it's incredible. So he was reading it within days. He must have gotten the electronic book, which you can do. And uh, he, he said, uh, he, he sent me an email on Saturday. He said, he's finished the book. He said, it's, he said, it's incredible. And he said on Sunday, he came back to me and said, would you be on my show next Wednesday, the 9th of December? And I was for about 15, 20 minutes. And it went well. And uh, <laughs> he kept talking about it for the next four days. But the book took off like a rocket. Was that sort of the start of the snowball rolling that downhill? The start, yeah, that was the start of a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, my, my son Judd got involved with it. And he had traveled on the road with Feld Entertainment for years. So he said there was a woman in their organization, whenever they came into a new city, she was in there a couple days earlier making contacts with media people and whatever, you know, advertising. So he called her to see if she could make some suggestions, and she put us in touch with someone else named Ike Richmond, and she said, Ike's the guy in Philly to do this. So Judd conferred with him, and they started something, and it took off. The article by Stephanie Farr in the Inquirer and the yeah. Daily News uh, right about that time, sometime before Christmas, that was a big deal. And a lot of the articles people may have read about it early on, like in the Times of London yeah. or the New York Post, uh, Golf Digest, all kinds of things like this, they were all based on her article. They didn't talk to me. So so this, so it's fair to say a year ago, I mean, we're, 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 it's, it's uh, May of 2021, just over a year ago, you had been sitting on these stories for a couple decades did it, did, had, were you telling these stories like at, oh. at buddies in, in, in South Philly bars? And, I'm Irish, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, sorry, right, goes with the territory. Drink my hand, a story comes out of yeah. my mouth. So, so. Well, yeah, I can't I, cultural appropriate I mean, uh, I, I, Irish yeah, men, but I, I told. I mean, I told them that anybody would sit still for a minute. You yeah. know, I told them to people standing in line at the beer distributor, <laughs> and you'd see this look on their face, like when you started. They'd say something like about the vet, and I say, yeah, I used to live there, and they say, yeah, I was down there a lot too. I said, no, I meant, no, no, I, I meant I lived there, and they what? <laughs> so we go through that little dance, and then, then you'd see this look on their eyes, and then after a while, you could see that they were like. Maybe, you know, because I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, I had, it's I, almost too far-fetched to be fiction. Well, that's what's protected me. That's how I got away with it. I hid in plain sight, yeah. and nobody believed it. I mean, the incredulity that people have when they hear the story now, and I, they come by that honestly. Yeah. Can I somebody believe. Google incredulity? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, would, I would, oh, you were a seal. Yeah, well, yeah, oh, okay. yeah. Okay. knuckle dragger. Okay, that's all right. Uh, we call you when we need you, though. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the, the, peop the people couldn't believe it now. Back then, the people that might have hurt me couldn't believe it. So they didn't pursue it. I mean, if they believed it enough to pursue it, they, they could have caught me easy enough because it wasn't, I really did hide in plain sight. And, and that's a recurring theme throughout the book is you, you continue to talk about hiding in plain sight. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, it, again, it's kind of fascinating that if you just, if you just look like you belong there, and, and, and because of your job, you did, but if you just look like you belong there, 
you yeah, just well, you can just exist and nobody questions it. I mean, basically, I, I like people. I, I'm, you know, and it's that's the way my family is, and we've always been in and around sporting events and catering events. Uh, and I was telling someone earlier here that you know I had worked at the Navy Marine Memorial Stadium as a kid. All those games, we'd go down on a Thursday. I'd get out of school Friday, you know, go down Thursday night with my dad. We'd set up on Friday, work the game, and come back up Sunday morning. But we were always in crowds of people and all working with the public and sporting events and events of that type. So uh, it was just a natural thing that I got to know everybody down there. I knew, I knew all the guys that worked for the stadium, like the electricians and plumbers and that and repair people. Yeah. I knew Charlie the mailman. I knew his kids' names. I knew Bill the guy that stepped outside of the Phillies' uh, office at night and fed the cats there. And you know He was like the night watchman. I knew everybody at all levels. And they all had stories, and they were all you know, they were all affable people and we were all in the same environment, so we'd talk and I knew everybody. I mean, I, I knew everybody. So, and I don't want to ruin the book for those who have read it, but y your uncles had a concession business with hot dogs, you got a job there working the parking lot, and, and, uh, and that led to you ultimately having a reason to be there on a, on a routine basis. Yeah. Um, uh, so, the, I, and I think it's a, a hilarious and it's a classic Philly story about how the apartment itself like the one night, and, and I wonder if you can just tell a little bit about that story, because I think it's a, a great segue into a lot, so much it, it, deeper. There's a chapter called Two Absurdly Incongruent Events. Yeah. And I challenged the reader to, I said, nobody could ever guess this. And, and they couldn't. It, it, it's, it would be impossible. One is, two things happened to create the apartment. One was Dick Vermeil hired a new tight end coach in the spring of 1977. The guy had never played professional ball, had played in college probably, Decent guy, sportsman and all that, but he was in over his head in terms of dealing with professionals. I mean, these were guys that had done all that and more. They were earning a living as professionals in a highly competitive and a very small community. And uh, he studied films when he came there to, to try and, you know, to get some chops and whatnot. And one of the things he came up with was that he suggested to his backup tight end that he could improve his time getting off the line of scrimmage at the snap if he changed his stance 180 degrees. This guy had been setting up one way since he first put a helmet sure. on when he was seven or eight years old. And now, after being a college all-star and winning the state championship in Texas with Tommy Kramer as his quarterback, you can imagine what that was like. Yeah. High school, you know, in San Antonio. Quarterbacks Tommy Kramer, now with the, then with the Vikings, yeah. and Richard Osborne. And then uh, Ozzy was in the pros. But he just couldn't, he, he, the vibes were bad. Plus, he thought his teacher, uh, his new coach, had too much interest in his extracurricular activities because Ozzy was a single guy on the Eagles, good looking, really, you know, the, the Eagles. There's a whole story behind that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A whole so story that's, that's its own that. podcast I even, by itself. I don't even know to go there, but, <laughs> but Ozzy, you know, women loved Ozzy and Ozzy loved women. And he was referred to in the after hours call in Stuart Bayakovsky's uh, gossip column as like, who was that midnight cowboy we saw in the back room at Lebec Finn with some prominent Philly attorney's trophy wife, something like that, you know. Yeah. And he took a beating for that in the lock, in the weight room. Every time he went in there, all of his buddies were, you can imagine how they were hitting on him with that. But his coach was too, and he thought he might not make the team. And he was, he was right. And, but his lease was up on an apartment down in Blackwood, New Jersey, just before camp at Westchester in July. His two roommates, Louis Giamona, running back and Vermeil's nephew, and Terry Totolo, a Samoan linebacker, the backup to Bill Berge, they were California guys, and they weren't coming back until the last minute before camp right. because they were away for six months from everybody they knew. So, you know, they held out to the last minute, and they weren't around to sign anything. If he signed something and got cut, he said, these two wild men could do anything, and I could end up in some real estate jackpot. So he said, can I store my furniture in that storage room you have across the hallway from, you know, your office? I said, he asked sure. Vermeil this, or he asked you this? Ozzy asked me this. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And so we, we moved his stuff, and it took us a couple trips. And then... Uh, and this is in some back corner, like, just no man's no, land of... No, of, no, It was on ground level. If you walked into the vet, if you walked up to the vet on ground level, went through my door, I had the only key to the outside door, and he went into my offices and truck bay at the back of that, which uh, was about 30 or 40 feet and real high ceiling. Uh, then there was another door into the inner concourse on the 200 level. Okay. And if you crossed that concourse, 
under the seats, under the level of the 300 level seats above that, yeah. that's where the apartment was. The door was on the 200 level. Or at the time, what was still a storage closet. It was a storage closet. That's soon to be apartment, yeah. It was a storage closet with a tractor trailer load of cardboard boxes, yeah. of parking tickets, a whole year's worth. Different colors, different numbering sequences, so we could keep flipping them every day to try to keep the kids honest. But uh, nonetheless, it was filled with boxes. So I re rearranged the box. Well, we moved his stuff in. I'm jumping around. Yeah. We moved his stuff into the apartment, and he did get cut. Ozzy called me from Westchester, said, the Turk just called me and told me to come down to his office and bring my playbook. That's a one-way trip for the playbook because yeah, yeah, right. he's about to shake his hand and say, have a good life, kid. So Ozzy said, can you pick me up? I picked him up. Sizemore said, there's a, flower, there's a key under the flower pot. Anne and the kids are away. You know, you can go, go over my place. So we went over there. We drank some beers, listened to Mick Jagger on the stereo singing, you don't always get what you want, played some pool. And around 1 o'clock in the morning, I ran him over to the airport for a red eye. So Ozzy, true to form, I mean, back then, this is 1979, yeah, 1979, you could go into the airport. So I'm up there and watching him go down the ramp. He's got his arm around one of the stewardesses. They've upgraded him to first <laughs> class. They're all giggling and stuff like this. And, and I yell, Oz, I said, what about that stuff in the storage room? He said, burn it, put it out in the 50-yard light. I don't care, I'm out of here. He jumps on a plane and goes back to San Antonio to wait for the phone to ring. It does about four or five games later because a tight end went down in St. Louis. They called him up. Called up Ozzy. I think Billy Bradley had been with the Cardinals after he after he left the Phillies, yep. the Eagles. He was there for a year, so he had he knew people there, and he called him up and said, "You know, this kid Osborne down in Texas, he'd be a good fit." Yeah. For so you. Ozzy takes off for for He's greener down, pastures. Yeah, his, his furniture's still sitting in his. His, his furniture's in there. You yeah. know, I forget all about it. The second incongruent event, which nobody would ever guess, is the Pope came to town. Pope came to town and had mass on the 3rd of October, 1979. I think it was a Wednesday. Uh, and I didn't know that I had to do anything about that. I thought I actually had two, two days in a row off, which I never got that. Every building was dark. Nothing at the vet, nothing at the spectrum for those two nights. And JFK, that was rare, you know. They, they didn't, big concerts there, but that was rare. Nothing there. And, and your job at the time is you're working the lots, right? I'm you're running all the parking lots. Running all the parking lots. Yeah, after bouncing around with odd jobs and, and having no career moves and being kind of a, uh, kind of a, uh, I mean, I wasn't a victim. I'm not looking for pity here, yeah. but, but I was a vet, and I kind of, uh, I went through some weird stuff in the mid-'70s after college and working full-time going to college. Then I had some more time to myself, and I started thinking more about, you know, what I've been through. And, and, and you go into that in the book, and I do want yeah, to talk, I, I want yeah, to talk a little bit yeah. about, about the, the therapeutic, yeah. oh. uh, like, discovery in, in the vet, and, and, it's, and oh. it's fascinating, but, but how you... The, the, the vet, the vet was a palliative. You know, yeah. it, it really, it, it helped me a lot. It but really, let's go back to the we're furniture's back. in here. Ozzy the takes Pope's off. coming to town. Pope's coming to town, right. I'm driving up Broad Street. I'm heading for the bridges. I'm going down the shore and kick back for a couple of days. This is great. Life is good. Yeah. Out of the radio comes this disembodied voice telling me in the world for the first time, this is the first time I heard it, that on, on Wednesday morning, since they can't, com they can't even figure out how many people are coming to this mass, it's a regular working day. It's not a holiday when people won't be in the city. It's a working day. So everybody that had to come into the city for their business or their, their occupation was coming anyhow unless they could duck it somehow. Yeah. And maybe a million to two million people might show up in addition to them. You can imagine what that would do to everything. So the city has decided that on this day, if you can't take public, tra public transportation, which they recommend, drive to the vet. The lots will open at 4 o'clock in the morning. This is news to me. I almost hit a guy crossing the street. <laughs> I mean, I was cursing the Pope, God, everything. You know, when you say I almost hit a guy crossing the street, there's a part in the book, and I don't want to ruin it, uh, where that guy crossing the street at one point was the Pope that you almost hit. No. No? No. I, I misread that. Did you have more shots? Yeah, apparently, yeah. Yeah, oh. I've mixed, I mixed two books together. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so I was uh, one of those guys at 4 a.m. trying to read the book and yeah, doing yeah, shots. But, but, but anyhow, um, yeah, so I had nobody to work because I, it wasn't scheduled. And all the guys that worked in my lot had the older guys that were supervisors all had jobs. You know, they couldn't yeah. just say, I'm not coming to work. One day. 
all of them. I mean, a couple did, but uh, and most of the kids that worked there were younger kids. They were, you know, guys and girls who were in high school, flagmen and, and yeah. you know, taking tickets and stuff like that. So I had nobody. So I, I called up uh, Dobbs Bar down on South Street and I said, Seamus, I said, because I've been smuggling these guys into games in obscene amounts. Yeah, yeah. You know, the statute of limitations has yeah. run out. I think you're good. Yeah. Oh, once, yeah. Once the vet came down, I think oh, you were good. I wasn't good. even worried about yeah. it then. You know, I, I should have been. Yeah. But, but uh, I said, Seamus, I said, I need a crew. So we put together a crew of guys that played in bands, bouncers, bartenders, people I knew, you know, all my blue collar, bon vivant friends. And uh, I couldn't trust them to show up at four o'clock in the morning. So uh, Seamus, and we're, we're talking about this, and he said, let's have a sleepover at the vet. And I started laughing. I thought, that's really funny. And then I looked at him, and he was serious. And, and I thought, that's not the worst idea in the world. So we met the night before at Dobbs. I stood them for pitchers of beer and burgers till from about 9 to 10.30. And then we all caravaned to the vet. I had a captive crew. Moved them into the vet, locked them in there, and we're in this storage area sleeping on whatever we can find. And Mike McNally from the electric factory says, he looks around, he goes, it, the lights are out, and he goes, you know, if you just clean this place up and rearrange the crap that's in here, this would make the coolest apartment in the world. I didn't think of that before. I had all this furniture, and so by the time the Pope's motorcade went up Broad Street and the lots were closed, I was rearranging this stuff, cleaning it, and figuring <laughs> out what, I moved a refrigerator in, I set up a complete kitchen in there, a guy's kitchen. It was a man cave on steroids because I had the Eagles and the Phillies playing as far away from my front door as the corner of the room. Yeah. So you, that but, the, but a seemingly first, innocuous comment the night before the Pope comes turns into yeah, I didn't think the about brain it. juices start going. You're like, you know, I hadn't thought actually, about it. and where are you living at the time? You're your mom's place, is that right? I was at my mom's temporarily because the place I'd lived in off Widener's campus, yeah. who someone bought it, it was changed hands, and the new owner, none of us had leases. We were all, you know, college kids who just stayed on there because yeah. it was cheap rent. And uh, he, was, he said he was going to fix it up and all this kind of stuff, and so he evicted everybody, which he could do. And uh, I had my stuff in my mom's garage, and I was, you know, looking around for an apartment, and then this came up. And if I remember correctly in the book, you arranged the, the boxes, because you said they're like a whole tractor trailer full of boxes with parking tickets that you get. Out. But you arranged the boxes so that when you come in the front door of the storage room, you don't, you actually have to, you have to you be got, pretty deliberate yeah, about finding I mean, the yeah. apartment, right? Any, any vet would set this up the same way. <laughs> if you open the, there's one door on the side, steel door. No that's a compliment to everybody in this room it, it, yeah, about a, our ingenuity. It is a compliment. Yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah. a survivor thing. A, but if yeah. you open the door and looked in, you would see from here to at least to the corner of this room, yeah. nothing but a corridor of boxes yeah. uh, about eight or ten feet high on both sides. And uh, at the end of that, it looked like it just went down and then there were boxes this way. So it looked like it just went to a dead end. But if you went back there, which nobody ever could do or would even think to do, yeah. you'd see there was a turn to the right and a double blind of boxes, and then you stepped into the area, you could see a complete AstroTurf area that was an apartment. And I had everything you could possibly want. Everything. Yeah. There's something that, that a Green Beret coming out of Vietnam would have thought up of, like, cardboard camouflage. I'm going to create this... Uh, Facade of boxes and behind it. It made my team house at Tuatara look like a Hyatt, you know. <laughs> yes. I mean, or a Hilton maybe, yes. you know. I mean, it was and it was, and it was a great location. So, uh, yeah, that's that's. I moved in and and I I stayed there from the night the Pope came to town, the night before, because that's the first night until the end of the contract, which was in 1981, the last day of 1981. It flipped over to another company. And that's about what two and a half years. It's about two years and three or four months. A lot of the articles say three years and all that, but it was about two years and I think four months. So you're living there, and this is where the book, and this is, and again, I don't want to ruin the book for those who haven't read it, you but you can't ruin it. This is, yeah, right. It's so surreal. It's insane. This is where uh, the aliens come down. And again, it could be just there could be so much off the, more off the wall stuff that you'd be like, oh, it totally fits right in with this kind of stuff. Everything from. Uh, you having interactions with the, the Philly legends like Dick Vermeil and, and Dr. J to uh, you were roller skating up on the roller seventh floor. Roller was my, that was, that's what I didn't foresee. Having, be, staying in there overnight, I would come back from South Street and go up to the, put, put my skates on. My skates at the time were state of the art. I mean, they were, they, these, these came right out of Long Beach. Terry Totolo had the same size foot as me. Any professional athlete in their contract is all kinds of stuff that they can't do. And if they do it and get injured and they can't play their sport, 
which the team yeah, has yeah. a lot investment in them, yeah. uh, they suffer major penalties. Like you can't skydive, you can't, you know, you can't roller skate. You can't, yeah, you can't roller skate. Yeah. You know, it's one of the things. So Terry had these skates. He was from Long Beach. He had these custom made high top leather skates <laughs> with a really nice truck on the bottom that you could do magic with. And you know, he, he said, I saw him in his apartment once, and he said, you can borrow me because you can have them for the season. I can't touch them. So I had these roller skates, and I would go up to the top of the vet, the 600 level, and roller skate around there at night. It was like a half-mile half, half mile oval, and you were on Best view of Philly. I mean, you can, better than money can buy. I can see it still. I mean, it, wow. was, it was a 360-degree view, view of the city of Philadelphia from what would be the equivalent of about a 10-story building yeah. with nothing but a small rail on the outside. So you had full vision. You'd, you'd come around and, and you'd see from the south, from the southeast, you'd see the airport and the planes landing. Then you'd see the river and the boats, you know, the, and the bridges and so forth. Center city with all the lights. On your high dollar roller skates. Yeah, and then cruising through with your shorty shorts. Yeah, just, yeah. University City, you know, the refineries and back around, and again and again and again. And I would do that until I, it was like a Zen thing. I would get in a state of bliss. But I also had a schizophrenic relationship with the vet in that one day I'd be sitting, walking around the vet and looking at the fans. I was always focused on the fans during games because I had the luxury of, I, I'll see this on film later if something happens, but I would watch the fans and, you know, up through the state. Hmm. So I would walk around there at night and, and just, but I'd be with 60 some thousand people in this raucous, wild, liver, you know, live or die, how they win or lose. Yeah. And then two nights later, I might be sitting at the top of the 700 level with a cold beer and just, you know, the full moon and sitting there and just going inside myself. You, you talked about having the Zen and, and there's a whole part of the book that, that we really haven't talked about that's really, especially being just a, a company of veterans and, and a community of veterans that, that, um, that I think probably resonates with, with our community a little bit more. And that's the part about Coming out of Vietnam, you're you're a decorated Green Beret coming out of Vietnam, um, but a lot of a lot of uh, you and I were talking just before the before the podcast about a lot of buddies that that unfortunately didn't make it home and and some guilt and some of that stuff that thankfully today we're dealing with a lot better and, yeah. and yeah. you know as a society and as a, as a, as the military but back in the day you you were struggling with ways to process this and you, and you found some opportunities to. To, to, as you said, find some zen and, and to, to be at peace with your emotions and work through that. Talk a little bit about it, because I, I think that's an interesting part of the book. One, I mean, I was in two bad border camps. I was, Tui Tar was right under the Idrang Valley, and I was there three years after that Joe Galloway's book, uh, We Were Soldiers Once. Yeah. There's a Mel Gibson movie with that title also. So that was on the other side of the mountain. And I think three or 4,000 Americans were involved in that battle, and it's the largest battle of the war. We lost 300 and some guys in about 72 hours. Yeah and that many people were involved. Two battalions on the ground, that's roughly 2,000, and an easy 2,000 more with air support and everything behind them, artillery fire bases they brought in, all that kind of stuff. I was running on operations on the other side of that mountain with one American. No air support, no artillery, nothing but some poorly armed Montagnards. And I was lucky. I mean, I, I was, we were good, but we, I was lucky too, and that counts a lot in, in combat situations. Then I was at Ducklop, a camp that had been overrun by a regiment of North Vietnamese, where they got inside the camp, couldn't take the whole camp, never got the Americans off the second hill, you know, for three days. They wow. fought each other inside the camp, yeah. and the camp was liberated. That's where I left Vietnam from when I finally left there. Yeah. I wasn't there when that battle took place. I'm sure. not saying that. I got but, there. But suffice to say, you came home, with, yeah. as we one, all do, right? Yeah, with, one day with you're, on, you're, you're on the mountain at Duck Lop looking across the Cambodian border at Nam Lier Mountain, where the regiment of, uh, regiment of North Vietnamese came yeah. from. And the next day, I'm punching a time clock uh, at 9th and Chestnut uh, yeah. in the computer center at the bank uh, for the next nine or ten months before I left there and went to Westinghouse. And I'm also a full-time day student. And it just was, you know... I remember standing there trying at the registrar for my first semester trying to get all morning classes so I could fit them into this schedule because I worked at night and these other kids were whining about they, they had a bunch of morning classes on their schedule and they didn't want to get up that early. You know, I'm thinking, I said, I'll take those classes, I'll take all of them, you know, I'll take all these morning classes. Yeah, and, and you know, you so don't process you, it, but you're so busy, then after a while, things start to, you know, you, when you have more time, it starts to sink in that, what? And you said that in the book, right? Yeah. You said there's a part where you talk about um, once I had, like, once I slowed down, because you stayed busy, I think you said that, like, going oh, yeah. to school and working hyper multiple busy. jobs, just hyper busy, and I think that's the word you use, right, hyper busy, 
And then when you get the job and you have this, this again, this, a, a, a stadium that holds 60,000 people, except for when it doesn't. Yeah. And then it's just you and at peace, an opportunity to be at peace with your thoughts. And, and I love so that. You're, you're skating around. I think at one point you said you slept, you went and slept, you took an I, air mattress upstairs, right? A couple upstairs, times right? I went up to the top of the 700 level. I, I, knew, I would never get on one side of the stadium because the Phillies' offices were there and somebody might come in at six or seven and look up and maybe see something. <laughs> yes. you know, so I'd do it on that side yeah. of the stadium so it was up above them this way. So I knew there was nobody. Very at that. calculated about all this. It's, it's, it's impressive. I didn't get caught. Yeah. I mean, you know, that was what drove Cataldi crazy. I mean, I got away with it. They should have taken me out in handcuffs or a straitjacket, but they didn't catch up with me. Who's that? They. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, who have the authorities. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> They. So, <laughs> that, and that's probably a good segue. I, I, you're living there. I mean, I mean, you know, 40 years later, it's, or it's a surreal story. Yeah. But, were, I mean, were you conscious, con constantly anxious about being caught? Uh no. Uh, or is it no. like, ah, if it happens, then, I mean. You know, I mean, it, then I'd deal with it, you know, yeah. or not deal with it. Because yeah. I wasn't dealing with it anyhow. I just Which is a very veteran response, right? I dealt with it response, by not dealing right? with it. That's yeah. a veteran response. Yeah. Like, nah, I, if it happens, yeah, it happens you know, I'll I mean, just deal with it. Yeah, I mean, you know. So, <clears throat> uh, I, I got to ask, and, and there's a couple in the book, and, and, I, and I wonder, the the most, and, and it's sur a, a surreal memoir is a, is a good title for it, because it, it is surreal. But I got to ask, is there... Um, is there is there are there moments where you look back and you go th th I can't believe I'm even telling this story like um, just one or two that stand out in your mind that you go this is I, I still can't believe that that this particular thing happened. Yes, uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm not insane. Yes, I, I get <laughs> I, 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 I get yeah I get it. In fact, when I put this together and when yeah. before Cataldi got a hold of it, when it was all together and I was reading it and reading it and trying to get you know proofreading it and get it as good as I could. It was like, I, I, a couple times I went like, my God, I can't, this is insane. Yeah. I mean, it starts out with that. It starts out with the idea, like if I overheard this story at a bar or yeah. a, a, a party, and I, I wouldn't believe it either, yeah. but I, I'd edge a little closer to see where this yarn is going, you know? Yeah. And I, I posed the question like, if you had no children, if you had no responsibilities, not even parents, you had to take care, nothing. It's just you and your, you know, in your late 30s, you drink a lot, you like to party, you know, and you're, you're in for a good time, but kind of irresponsible. Would you, if you had the opportunity, uh, would you, if you had the opportunity to live in the sports stadium of a team, teams that you grew up loving as a kid? Yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah. Come here, Mosey. Oh. Dog here, on the pup. looser. You got her? Come here, Mom. Come here. Come here. Uh, can we get you up with that? Uh, come here, Mosey. Oh, here we go. Okay, wait a second. Don't drop her. Oh. Come here, Mel. Ah, there we go. Sorry for that. No, it's it's good. If uh, it's service animals are as welcome here as as, as the vets themselves. Um, wildest moments um, in your time there. Um, the wildest moment. Especially being a, a Philly yeah. kid, like growing up with one, some of these one, legends. Well, yeah. Um, I remember when. Uh, I remember when the Phillies played the Cowboys to go to the Super Bowl, our first Super Bowl. Eagles. E Eagles, Cowboys, first Super yeah. Bowl. Got it. It's a, it's, yeah. It hits quick. Yeah. Trust e me. I Eagles. The Eagles, when they beat the Cowboys in the vet, it was the, one of the few games I remember during my time was played in January. It was January 14th. And uh, Wilbur Montgomery broke through. Uh, it was an off-tackle run. And when he went through the line, I looked down at it. I was walking around the, between the five and 600 level seats on that walkway that went all the way around there. That's where I happened to be. And I'm walking around there, and I saw him go through the line. And I knew he was going all the way. I looked at the field, and I knew he was, nobody was going to touch him. Nobody could get near him. Jerry Sizemore, if anybody ever looks at that on YouTube, and it's available, Sizemore manhandled too tall Jones. He pushed him back to the right in a big loop that made him so far out of the play that when Wilbert broke free, Jones didn't even chase him. He just stood there because he knew he'd never catch him. There was nobody who was going to lay a finger on him. When I saw that play break, I realized that we were going to the Super Bowl. 
And instead of watching him go to the end zone, I knew I'd see that a thousand times if I wanted to on film. I turned around and I looked up through the 600 level seats and the 700 level at the people that have been so hungry for this for so long. Yeah. Any, of, any of them that ever hear this, they know what I'm talking about. They were on their feet. They were, it was Christmas. It was their senior prom. It was everything they ever wanted. And they were going nuts. And I looked at those faces, and I just watched those because I knew I'd never see that on film again. Wow. Like that. And it was just incredible. Yeah, yeah. to recognize yeah. That, that what it means to a city or just to a group of people to have. To have yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, they're going to get in the parking lot. They're going to drive home. They got, you know, they need gas. Yeah. Maybe I'll run out of gas. Because not know. everybody lived yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah. They're, they're going back to their lives <laughs> with all the pitfalls that we all have in our lives. But in that moment, they were, it was just like the reward of a lifetime. That's a, that's, that's a fascinating. Yeah. There was an article that came out just a, like two weeks ago. It says, report, homeless man infiltrates USC, University of Southern California, football practice, sits in the jacuzzis with players. Uh, homeless man infiltrated the uh, Trojans practice Thursday. Apparently he lived there and, uh, and, and actually put on, here's a, he's pretty young looking and could pass as a college student. He's about 5'10", but I heard he wore the number 87 jersey at practice. The guy who actually wears 87 is 6'4", so that was a giveaway. If you had to offer advice to this, uh, this guy who, who uh, clearly wasn't as shrewd as you are, what would you, uh, what would you sell this kid? Don't, don't jump on the practice squad? No, in 2021, I'd say get a good lawyer. <laughs> yeah, because, fair, fair enough. You know, I mean, back then, I don't know what would have happened because it never happened. Yeah. But, I mean, they should have led me out of there in handcuffs or a straight jacket. And maybe I would have been able to wiggle out of it. I guess it probably would have, I would have probably been a favorite in the Daily News and things like that yeah. for the, all the things that it is now. But uh, my uncles would have been, Tug McGraw told me one time, and he, he loved this so much, he fell off his bar stool when he hit his punchline. Tug said, you know, if your uncles found out about this and got in trouble because of you, he said, they'd feed you, they'd feed your body into that machine that makes hot dogs down at Medford Meats in Chester. <laughs> he said, you'd be, consu yeah. you'd be yeah. consumed with yellow mustard all over your ass up on the 700 level somewhere. And then Tug thought of this and he said. Very graphic of Tug, by the way. Yeah, he says, your coffin would have been, he says, your coffin would have been a hot dog roll. You know, and he fell, <laughs> he, he, he went down on the floor on that line. He was a good storyteller, and he, you know, he loved a good line, and it just came right out of him. Hey, I, I want to thank you for coming out, and, I, and we have such a, a great audience here. Uh, I want to open it up for questions. Sure. Uh, we have a lot of uh, guys that are, are, are Eagles fans and, and remember the vet, and and uh, and uh, so I, uh, before we do that, I just want to talk a little bit about. So this is so the secret apartment is actually your second book. Your first book is uh, a, a better book. Is, it took forty book. years to write this book. This one came out in a couple months, although I told the stories. But this one is about your time in Vietnam. That's in Vietnam. That's right. running. That's living with the Montagnards. And I've confessed to myself uh, with a little guilt as I thought about this. But when I went to Vietnam, I, went, I, I loved the Montagnards. I loved going up in the mountains. They were simple people. They, they were, these are the... Uh, yeah, these were not Vietnamese. Yeah, yeah. These were people from the jungle up in the mountains. They had very little contact with the Vietnamese. I had a very sensible, educated Vietnamese woman one time tell me with complete candor that she thought that they had tails. She'd heard that the Montagnards actually had tails. They thought they were animals. Yes. Their word for them was M-O-I, I think it's called Moi, and that, that meant savages. They thought they were savages. They were illiterate because they had no, they weren't illiterate because they didn't get to go to school, which they didn't, they were illiterate because their culture had never developed an alphabet. There was no alphabet. They had no ABCs. They had nothing to make words with. Everything was oral. Hey, Tom, thank you so much for making time for us. This we cool. uh, we know that we know the us. book is going to go and do big things. The movie's going to be even bigger. We'll have, a, we'll have a screening of the movie here when it uh, when it finally comes out with uh, with Rob McElhenney in it. Yeah, I hope, um, I hope he's in it. Hey, uh, where can folks uh, find the book on Am Amazon? Amazon, it's on uh, Barnes & Noble has it. I know friends uh, sent me pictures. They saw it down at the one at, uh, in Montgomeryville, I've, and uh, it's also up at the one in uh, down at uh, Rittenhouse Square. It's there. Uh, it's sold at my daughter's place down on Pass Yonk Avenue, which is really cool. I give her a plug in the, in the book, The Secret Apartment. It's, uh, she's on Pass Yonk Avenue. It's called Urban Jungle. And they've got a garden place, but what they do is they turn the front of your row home into a garden. They can do a vertical garden. They can turn, if you want green on the whole thing, you know, they can do it. Right. Plants, we'll put, flowers, we'll put her link so up on our website. So, so 
Huh? Veteran-owned as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kurt's a, uh, he's an Airborne Ranger from, uh, he was in the Army. Awesome. And uh, uh, he's a West Pointer. I think he graduated around 80, 81. And it's on Amazon. Uh, it's, it's on Kindle as well. Yeah. Uh, and uh, can, yeah. Folks, are, can folks find you on the Internet? Are you somewhere on the interweb? Yeah, we're we're out there. I mean, there's there, there's even a there's a, there's a Facebook uh, page that Judd set up for me on uh, uh, the secret apartment. Okay. So if you go in there, or if you Google the secret apartment, all kinds of stuff pops up. It's, yeah. It's insane. We'll make sure we. Uh, I can't we put believe that up there as well. all the. I can't believe how this took off. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's fascinating from a year ago to where you are now, and, and we're happy to get in on the on the front end of it well, thank as, you. Uh, as as you go on to do bigger and, and greater things with the book. Okay. Hey, thanks again. Really okay. appreciate okay. it. Okay. All right. Thanks, Tom. Oh, by the. <clears throat> thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Green Castle Podcast. Please be sure to give us a like, a thumbs up, a share. You can find us at greencastleconsulting.com forward slash podcast or on all the major podcast channels and the social media channels, including our YouTube channel. Thanks very much. We'll see you on the next episode.